So it's lovely to be here, and I just want to um, echo Jill's um, sentiments as far as Kerry's concerned. She really has done an amazing job, and just seeing everybody here today is testament to the hard work and determination of this woman. She's absolutely unstoppable. Um, so this is the, these are the people here who um, were the people who did the research. Um, Jill was our partner, and that home hospice was also our partner in this research. But um, Rosemary, Nikki, Kerry, and me, um, on the end, we're the people that did the um, field work and the analysis and stuff. And Nikki, who's hiding on that table over there. So, um, <laughs> but just a little bit of background. So we came to this research, and, and we all know this, knowing that most people, about 80%, depends what, what you read, want to die at home, yet only about 16% of people get to do so. We know that at least one generation hasn't seen care of the dying in Australia. And this is actually a quote from the research. And this was one of the things that surprised us was that people didn't think they were allowed to die at home. It was really, you know, like people think they're not allowed to have babies at home either. It's, it, it completely flabbergasted me. Who do they think they need permission from? It's an interesting question. Um, so people haven't seen the care of the dying and people certainly don't know that they can die at home. We know that the majority of deaths in this country are expected and we also know that most people, other than us in this room clearly, um, don't like to talk, think about or plan for dying and death. So that was the sort of background um, stuff that was floating around, I suppose, in terms of how we got together and where we came from. Um, this is one of the last questions that we came up with when we wrote our report and you will all be getting a copy of this um, later in the day. Um, but I thought it was a good question just to put up at the beginning because it seems to me that that's what we're doing here today. We're, there is a national conversation that is starting. I think it's a global conversation, actually. Mm. Um, the conversation started and we're, we're joining in. And it seems that there's a lot of um, talk happening. And where I'm coming from is I'm talking about this in terms of social justice. Mm. So for me, it's a social injustice that 80% of people want to die at home and 16% get to do so. So that gap to me is something about injustice. Um, so that's where I'm coming from and where we were coming from. Um, so our sort of questions that we had when we came to this research and where I think this research is a bit different is we didn't, it's not problem-based research. It's not looking at what's the problem, why can't me, yes, but. What we were interested in doing was talking to people who had already done this. So if the figures are roughly 16% of people get to die at home, well, how did people manage that? Who are these people? What did they do? Let's talk to the people that are connected with the 16%. Um, so we're not, we weren't talking about the gap. We were talking about the people who've done it. And I love this quote by Bell Hooks. It's about illuminating the space of the possible. It clearly is possible. People clearly do do it. So let's find out how. Um, and the, the other questions follow from that. So what does it actually take for someone to die at home? What are the stories of ordinary people who have supported someone to die at home? Ordinary people, I'm not 100% happy with that particular term, but I, I use that to differentiate that from um, service providers or volunteers that are attached to a particular um, palliative care service. And the, our other question was, how can we enable people to talk to us about difficult things? It's not easy stuff to talk about. It's particularly not easy stuff to talk about, not just because it's about dying, but it's about we wanted to talk to the carers and the friends and supporters of the carers who think they do nothing. So, <laughs> so it was, OK, we want you to talk to us about supporting someone to die at home, um, and we want to talk to the people who think that they're not doing a great deal. Um, so we had to come up with some way of getting people to tell us those stories and share them, which we did. So these are the more formal research aims that we had that came out of their questions. Um, understanding how people, how being involved impacts family, friends and the wider community. We wanted stories, it's story-based research, so we actually wanted the narratives of caring networks. So we call the, so you, usually there's a primary carer and around that carer there's a network of people, hopefully. And that could be friends, neighbours, work colleagues, people from the church group, whoever. It was that sort of group that we were interested in talking to, and we call them the care network. Um, and we wanted to know what um, happened to those networks as they were established and or strengthened as a result of this process. 
Um, we're very much situated within a community development approach to end of life care. And we wanted to um, get some more research, some more money to do more research, and we've met that out. And we talked to 96 people. The age range was 7 to 90, and we had four dogs, <laughs> who were not an insignificant um, part of the um, process. This particular dog's called Nelson. We have them on the transcripts <laughs> at times, often at very poignant times. They were the times when I listened to the transcripts that <coughs> caught me, anyway. Um, the, the animals are quite significant. They've got a whole page in here. Yeah. So, moving on to the onto the findings. So th what I want to do really here today is to tell you what people told us. So this isn't what we say, this is what the people we spoke to had to say. Remembering that these are the people who've done it, who've supported someone to die at home. If there's italics and it's blue, that's a direct quote from a participant. Um, so each and every one of you had this little part to play. Everybody we spoke to, without exception, um, said that to do this task, takes a community and the community needs to work together. Um, these communities comprise an extraordinary set of very complex relationships which people continuously no negotiate through the process of caring. We were quite amazed at the level of skill people um, exercised in negotiating relationships um, at, the, at a you know, time of life when they're quite um, vulnerable and stretched. Not just the primary carer but all the people in the network. At some stage, they, they, they had this negotiation and were very skilled at it, which was um, great to see and unexpected. For, m for me, anyway, it was unexpected. Um, in terms of the, the um, network, people spoke very much about what we've called, well, this particular person named it for us, a core team and an outer team. So when I say a complex set of relationships, this is how they saw them. So they saw them as an inner circle, then a next circle, and the next circle. And a number of people spoke to us in that way. So they were very aware that they needed their um, very close people to, to support them. This is the primary carer. But then that, those people couldn't do everything. Like one carer can't do everything. The three or four very close friends can't do everything either. They needed support. And then they needed support. And they needed support. And the... Um, the paid care providers, if you like, are out here. That's, that's how they saw them. They're out here, which is probably where people would see themselves. And then there's layers, like, a bit like an onion in lots of ways. Um, and that's how one person actually described it. Um, the next thing that we found, one of the um, things in the literature about this sort of work is that um, caring is isolating. Um, and that's part of the things that makes it really difficult. A lot of the carers and care networks were aware that this could be isolating. So they had that awareness. They're not stupid. They're doing a pretty good job. And they worked really hard to resist that. So they put strategies in place to make sure. And they didn't need to be told to do that necessarily. They did that. They worked hard to do that um, using clear and controllable communication. So landlines were used. But most people talked a lot about the um, internet and computer and um, texting. So the computer and, and uh, mobile phone with texting, that's what this is. Uh, <laughs> I don't actually do it like that. It's more like this. But, um, people have more control over that often than the landline, they found. So they could sit and answer emails at midnight if they wanted to. They could send out an email to 50 people. It didn't just have to be one. So that was quite an interesting new technology, new for me, technology thing that came in. Um, and a lot of people talked about that. It also brought the global community, if you like, into the home often. Um, so it wasn't always people actually coming into the home um, physically. Often people were coming into the home virtually. And that was really important for a number of people. Not everybody. One person refused to get a mobile phone because they didn't feel they'd be able to deal with the number of messages that were coming in. Um, but I, I wanted to just make the point that people were aware that they had the potential to become isolated and excluded, and they put in things to make sure that that didn't happen. A number of people drew on previous experiences of being a dying per with a dying person. In a way, we expected that because um, about 60% of our participants had a connection with home hospice. 
and home hospice mentors have already had experience of being with a person who was dying. So we expected that finding from that group. We didn't expect it so much from the four, about 40% of people who had no connection with home hospice. Um, but all but one group that we spoke to had somebody in there who had some experience in the past. Not of necessarily someone dying at home. <coughs> Often it was someone dying in hospital and it hadn't been very good experience. So they were then motivated to um, take that out. I'll talk about that a bit later. And the other thing that people used very much um, to stay connected was humour and remaining light-hearted. <coughs> and again, that was probably not a surprise to those of you who work in the field, but that was a surprise to me. I expected it all to be very miserable, but, <laughs> but it, it wasn't. Um, and again, in the focus groups and the interviews, there was equal mixture of people ro roaring with laughter and crying. So it was, you know, that both things happening. Um, this, is a, uh, this is what we did with the photos. They took photos, they then named them if they wanted to, and then explained why they named them. So this is the whole process. Um, this photo is called Joy, and it's called Joy for a couple of reasons. One was that a group of us, school mums, had come to be with Jill because she couldn't come out and have coffee. We had a routine. So we had come, and I did some scone making lessons, which was hilarious because I can't cook. <laughs> so that was part of it, and the other part was Kath's response to the smell of that. So the person who's talking here um, was friends with Jill, who was the primary carer. So this is a group of people that came into the house to support the primary carer. Um, and the, the person who was dying got something out of it too, but it wasn't, this exercise wasn't just about the person that was dying. So again, another example of the community coming into the house <coughs> and things happening. Being light-hearted, I, when I first started, like I had 50 quotes for this and I had to to show you, but these are the two that um, I really like. There was lots of laughter and lots of storytelling. It was very noisy. It was like being in the middle of a hen house. A lot of people would think you're being very irreverent and laughing, but we couldn't help ourselves. You have to see the funny side of it. It was like a release valve. Lots and lots of stories about humour. In fact, really quite dark humour. <laughs> and lots of photos of people having a good time. Um, in amongst all of this. And I think, I see a lot of you nodding, so clearly you're people who know that this is so. I'm, not a, I'm a person who didn't know this is so, and I'm the majority, because the majority of people don't work in this area. And I think this is part of the message we need to get out there, that yes, it's really difficult, yes, it's really hard, and you can laugh, you can have fun, you can thump each other with things in the swimming pool. Um, that, that really surprised me. And I think that's what the sort of stuff that would really surprise a lot of people out there who just wouldn't talk about things like this. Anyway, the other thing that really surprised me and, and those of us on the team, sorry, I'm speaking for the team, I forget, um, was the agency that the dying person had in establishing caring networks. So the dying person themselves was often very instrumental in making sure that the carer was being cared for, that there were a number of people involved, that it wasn't just left up to one person. Um, Janet. And here's some examples. So I don't feel like I'm dying, I'm just slowing down. I like the fact there are so many people that it keeps them light. This particular person organised the weekly get-togethers, organised respite for his parents, organised, knew who had time when, and he was like this central hub that was organising everybody and getting things happening when he needed things to be happening. This is what I want, this bottom quote, which is why I always use it. When it's my turn, I want people drinking wine around my bed and hopefully drinking wine myself. But again, it's an example of how in this particular example, the mum was dying and she, w she wanted this to be happening. She wanted her daughter to be surrounded by people, to be relaxing, to be having a glass of wine at the same time. And that's what made her happy. So they made it happen. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary. So everyone doing a little bit makes a big, strong net. Um, we found an overwhelming diversity of caring tasks that people are engaged in. And I suppose the, 
you know, food was a big thing. Food's always there. People think food's a cliche. I think it's a cliche for a reason because it's really useful and necessary. But there are a lot of um, examples of things that weren't so obvious. And it was providing what was actually needed rather than what people assumed was needed was the key. And the main motivation for why people, in terms of the caring networks, kept involved was they wanted to keep life as normal as possible. So that was when you asked people why were they doing what they were doing. It was about, well, we need to keep life as normal as possible. We need to, the children still need to go to school, the homework still needs to get done, the shopping needs to, the dogs need to be taken for a walk. Um, so that was um, quite an interesting thing for us. I suppose you think it's just an everyday thing, it's just what you do to help. You don't think of it as a chore, and all those ordinary things done to help add up to something quite extraordinary. None of it was rocket science. It was all things that most people can do, and even if people couldn't do them as they wanted, they worked out ways where they could do them in their way. And the example that stands out in my mind is one neighbour who couldn't bear to go in the house because a dying person was in the house. But she wanted to help. So she made food, um, took it round, pressed the bell, put it on the doorstep and ran off. <laughs> now, yes, it's funny, but she wanted to help. She knew she couldn't go in, but she knew she could do something. So it was working out well, what could she do and not necessarily making herself really, really uncomfortable. That was really useful for that family. And the last thing they needed was their neighbour coming in and not being able to cope. So it was really good that she rang the bell and ran away. <laughs> they didn't need to look after her as well. Um, so they're really ordinary things. They really are quite ordinary. People can do them. Um, and I, this other quote is another favourite of mine. She didn't need massage or meditation lessons. She just needed firewood. Um, and I put that one in there because often we do think of more the massage meditation side of things but sometimes it's just really practical stuff as well like who's doing the washing can they afford that extra washing powder this week have they got enough wood to keep them warm as well again not rocket science simple simple stuff and um i just need to uh say we think that Kerry coined this term about three years ago. Other people are picking it up now. When we were talking about this, it, it was transformational for everybody involved, as you'd expect. Transformational for the carer, transformational for the family, transformational for the work colleagues, the neighbours. Everybody on at some level was transformed by being involved in this process. So change happens. You participate, you change. It's... Um, I think I've probably said all that. So, and that was at an individual and a collective level. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. People developed knowledge and skills about caring and the process of dying that empowered them and which they took into other networks and other communities. So I suppose, it, I suppose it's a good thing if transformation happens at an individual level, but um, mass change isn't going to happen if it stays there if it stays at an individual level. You've got to do something with that. And what we found was that people were doing something with that. Um, they were taking it out into their other networks, their other communities. really simple example of that is what I said earlier. People who've had the experience already use that experience then to support someone else. So you get that, that happening. Social capital was increased as a result of being um, in the caring network and the community's capacity to care improved. So these were some of the results that actually happened. Um, and individual and collective death literacy was developed as a result of those. Some examples of transformation. Most of the literature about caring, as you'd know, is that it's a burden, it's a stress, um, it's really hard. All those things are true, um, but there's very little about what else caring is and being involved in this is. And we found we had a lot of stories coming up which spoke of a different story about caring. Um, and here's some, it, it was mostly people talked about it being a joy and a privilege. There's joy that's within this household despite the grey hollows. I love that quote because it's saying it's both. There's both here at the same time. It's not one or the other. Uh, it's more complicated, it's more complex. There's something that this space was alive with, love, light, mystery, and so I really enjoyed that. A lot of talk about love. Um, not many academics will talk about love. <laughs> um, we mention love in our, in our project. 
we're a bit different. Um, I don't know how you can think that being that someone being so sick was special, but it was very special. Um, I think this is really important because a number of people that I've spoken to as part of being involved in this research is, you know, do you think you'd be one of those people who'd like to die at home? And they all say, I don't want to be a burden. And I can now say, but nobody who's done it talks about it like that. They say it was intimate, you know, they felt special, they were privileged. They don't say it was easy, no one said it was easy, but they say all these other things too. I find that really moving. Trans in terms of transformative effects on individuals, everybody developed knowledge and skills that they didn't have before. So if you're not, for a lot of people, this was the first time. It wasn't the first time for everybody, but for the majority, it was the first time. So they all developed knowledge and skills. And I put that first quote up there because it's a very medically sounded, I don't even really understand. The, the quote um, about the, I can't pronounce the endoscopic, I need a nurse to pronounce that for me. But this was the carer who learned how to do that and felt really, really proud that he managed to do that for his wife. Um, and then a more a different sort of quote, I've grown, grown a lot or learned a lot. All the stuff I now know that I had no idea about makes a really big difference. So people learn through participating. It was an embodied sort of knowledge that they got through being part of this, which again is what you'd expect. But I don't think people have written it down before in lots of ways. People's attitudes changed as a result of being part of this experience. Um, and this quote here uh, shows that in some ways. So my children were with me and my husband when he died. We were all there and when I said, Dad's gone now, they said, no, he hasn't. He hasn't, because he looks just the same. But he had, you see, and they were surprised because they didn't know what they expected. But they didn't expect it to be so normal and his death was actually easy. And again, that's not going to be true for everybody, but it was true for that family. It wasn't what they were expecting, but now those children know that death isn't always difficult for the person. So they've learned something completely different to what popular culture would have them believe. Rippling out, so in terms of people learning this sort of stuff and, and it having a transformational effect on them, um, as I said earlier, it's important that that's then, something's done with that, that it, it sort of ripples out. Um, and here's some examples of how it's rippled out for the people that we spoke to. We want to help everyone and anyone to draw support and information from Lorna's experience. So there's a real drive and motivation to use what they now know um, and go out there and help anybody that will listen to them. An example of somebody who's out there being an advocate. I'm very proud to see her as an advocate for other people and using her experience to be an enabling thing in community for others. And the stuff that you taught me, I want you to know that I've built myself up a lot in caring for my older people at work. So three different ways that this is rippling out. Gone over time. In terms of the networks, we did a process called network mapping. Um, and this is what we did. So we gave people texters and we asked them to show us what their caring network was like before caring and show us what it was like after caring. And this was a fantastic exercise. It, kids love this. Um, everybody got up and, and filled, filled it in. Um, somebody said to me yesterday, it looks like chaos and then more chaos. But <laughs> <laughs> I thought the difference is... So um, we got people to do this and then we would hold up the sheets of paper and say, what do you notice? Um, and the different colours mean something. So red is it's an intense relationship, blue it's not such an intense relationship and yellow it's not a very intense relationship at all. Um, and we were worried that people would find that difficult, not in terms of it's a difficult concept, but they would find it hard to say to people, oh, you're my <laughs> yeah, you're red and you're a yellow. Most people didn't find it difficult at all. It was us being precious, I think. Um, and most people did it. And then we'd hold them up and ask them what they noticed. So this was about them telling us what they noticed about it. And they noticed what you notice, which is that the second piece of paper has more lines on than the first piece of paper, that there's more people on the second piece of paper than the first piece of paper. There's more red and blue on the second piece of paper. So basically, the networks increase. People, Kerry and I, at one stage when we were 
getting lost in data, said, we should just tell people to do this because you make more friends. <laughs> <laughs> which, which seems to be true. Um, I've got some quotes there. And they're not just friendships that are flash in the pan friendships. And again, when you say it, it's obvious, isn't it? If you've been through this with people, you would expect any friendships made would be lasting friendships because it's a pretty intimate, emotional, um, high energy time of life. And this is, this is actually from a, a male carer um, who talks about the fact that it was about friendship. It's not just that they've done a good deed and that's the end of that. They've continued the friendship and they've got to know families. And that was a story that was repeated through, throughout the researchers. Um, it's another example of rippling out, I think, is that you start, this group started quite small and then it grew and grew and grew and grew and people knew more people. They had different sorts. It wasn't just the number of people they knew. It was the quality of the relationships that they had with people. They had conversations that they wouldn't have had before. They talked about things that they wouldn't have talked about before. Um, they, they just, you know, community development, <laughs> really, um, but in quite a meaningful sort of way. I think this is the last one. So in terms of looking forward, which is what we're here to talk about today really, it's about the community caring, one of our um, participants said. Um, so caring for someone to die at home must be one of the hardest jobs there are. But ordinary people do it and they seem to be able to do it quite well. And I suppose from our point of view in terms of the research, this is one of the messages we'd like to get out there. It, it is possible. We've talked to people who've done it and they do it quite well. They can't do it on their own. So I hope that's come through quite clearly too. It does take a community and it does take a network. But it doesn't use up the community or use up the network. It actually grows community and grows networks. So a lot of people worry when you're talking about this sort of thing that it's going to be something that sucks things out. It doesn't. It seems to grow things. It grows relationships and friendships. And I think that's... Oh, no, it's not. So in terms of what's needed from that, um, we think that it, what's needed is we need to establish support and negotiate informal support networks um, if the growing home death movement in Australia is to be sustainable. And I'd like the home death movement to name itself as the home death movement. <laughs> um, carers need permission and practical hands-on help to gather caring networks together and to negotiate the type of help they need. So not everybody's as able to do that as as everybody else, so they need help to do that, often. Organisations and services that provide pay, pay care at end of life, we think, need to take an active role in promoting death literacy and supporting informal caring networks from a community development or health promotion perspective. That's me done. So thank you for listening.